in the Bible, one of the great buzzwords is the word to see. And that is certainly true of the New Testament. The New Testament makes a great fuss about seeing Jesus. They say we want to see Jesus. King Herod is very keen to see Jesus. And eventually when Jesus appears before him, he sees him physically. But he wants Jesus to perform some miraculous trick, a game which Jesus does not play. Herod is deeply disappointed and sends Jesus back to Pilate. He has seen Jesus, but he has seen nothing. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Jesus comes and walks beside them. They see him, but they don't see him. He walks with them, enters into conversation with them. They see him, but they don't see him. He begins to open the scripture to them, and we learn later that then their hearts began to burn. But it's only when he accepts their invitation and comes in and sits at table with them and breaks the bread in a moment that is clearly Eucharistic that we are told their eyes were opened and they actually see Jesus, the one who is risen from the dead. Before they had seen him without seeing him and now they see him. But the strange thing is that as soon as their eyes opened, he vanishes from their sight. Why? Because once your eye is opened to see him, you don't need him sitting across a table physically because you see him everywhere. You drown in Jesus because there's no place where Jesus is not. The only question is, do you have the eye that sees him? Not whether he's there or not. He's certainly there, even in the darkest corner of the human heart or the darkest depth of the world. He's there. That's what the darkness of Calvary means. There is no darkness he has not entered. The only question is whether we have the eye that sees. In the gospel that we have just heard, Jesus says to Nathanael, whom he has seen under the fig tree. See, Jesus sees us in a way we can barely imagine. Sees us to the very depths of our being. He sees Nathanael under the fig tree. And he says to him, you will see far greater things than this. Because what will you see, Nathanael, under your fig tree? you will see Jesus Christ risen from the dead. You will contemplate the face that shines with the glory of Easter. So like Nathaniel, I invite you now to look at the image of Christ that is on the screen. Focus on the face. And I mean focus, don't just gawk, but look with the eye of faith, the eye that has the deep vision that we call contemplation. It's an ancient icon of the Saviour risen, an icon found at the monastery of St. Catherine that stands at the foot of Mount Sinai. It may be ancient, but it's strangely familiar. And I do mean strangely familiar, 
In some ways the figure is strange, as Christ always is, as direct and as distant as lightning. But there's something familiar, even about the eyes, how human they are, one not not quite the same as the other. It's an old icon, but it has its newness. Who is looking at whom? He is certainly looking at me and you and with a gaze that does not flinch. So we look at him, he looks at us. We contemplate him and he contemplates us. It's the face of one who has authority, immense and strange authority, but there isn't a hint of the authoritarian. It's a face that's not only unthreatening, but has about it a sense of intimacy. He knew what was in a human being. And yet it's the face of one who is never matey. There are the distances. The face has an innocence. He goes to his death like a lamb to the slaughter. And yet it's the face of the one who knows everything. Everything. There's a great gentleness about the figure, about the face in particular. even a touch or a hint of sadness, but there's an immense strength, the strength of the one who can stand silent before Herod and before Pilate and go to his death. The face is silent. He says nothing although the shape of his right hand is the sign that he is communicating to us. And this is the truth, that the face may be silent, but there is a powerful communication the longer you look at the face. Silent he may be, but communicate he certainly does. Also in the book that he carries the book that bears his living voice. There's a great inwardness about the figure. Self-contained. He needs no one. And yet he is profoundly other-directed. He may be deeply inward, but absolutely not self-absorbed. Absorbed in the other. There's a nobility, even a touch of the aristocratic about the figure. There's something regal about the face, a majesty. And yet also something very ordinary. He's one of us. There's something very elegant about the figure. 
and about the face. And yet something very earthy, even the clothes he wears, are ordinary. They are not regal. And the humility, perhaps that above all, the humility with the majesty. There's a hint of trouble in the face and yet an immense calm. Troubled and yet untroubled. There's something otherworldly about the figure and the face and yet something intensely human. There is something divine that sense of God but in the end there's something profoundly and poignantly human. In other words, the greater thing that we see in contemplating his face now is the truth of the incarnation. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory. We saw him die, we saw his shame, and we saw the fullness of his glory shining on his face in the moment of Easter. The face of the one who saw Nathaniel under the fig tree, the face of the one who sees us.